Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking. And the third class in our Start Woodworking series. The first class, I kind of just introduced the concept I was going for in this series. And we built the biggest project of the entire course. This workbench. In the second class, I kind of went over the very basic set of hand tools we'll be using. Plus the one power tool we missed. And we really did focus deeply on that complex power tool. The bandsaw. We also kind of explored the simplest tool we'll be using. A Sloyd knife. And we made a little spoon. In the next class, the fourth class, I am going to introduce the holy trinity of hand tools. We are talking the saws, the planes, and the chisels. And to do that one, we are going to build a... Heirloom style, but very simple to build toolbox so that I can house all these things because I want to use my workbench and they're just getting in the way. They're so cluttered up. But in this class, the third one, we're going to modify this workbench so that we can build not only that project, the toolbox, but everything else out there because you need to be able to work on a board on its face on its side and on its edge in multiple different manners in order to work. To work. And right now, all we have is a very solid, flat surface to do work with. So today, with about five dollars in hardware and the scraps from our workbench, let's go ahead and build a planning stop, a hold fast, a work, uh, a, a bench hook and a twin screw vise so that we can accomplish all those tasks with whatever we are working on. Now, in my normal workbench, I have dog holes, which they're just little three quarter inch holes that you drill into the workbench. And with three quarter inch dowels, you know, you can raise and lower them up all over the workbench to give you different things to bump up against. Well, we haven't drilled holes in this workbench yet, but we probably will in the future just because I like using hold fast. So in order to kind of mimic that, a simple yardstick clamps the edge of the board. I now have something I can rest a board against to plane. I can push on this pretty hard. It works pretty well as a mechanism to be able to work on the face. Next, I need to be able to work on the end grain, both in planing, which we probably won't use in this project, but we will be wanting to saw across the grain. The best thing for that is a bench hook. To make the bench hook, I've got a scrap piece of plywood from our workbench build and a couple pieces of scrap wood. Uh, once again, a yardstick makes great work. I just happen to have a piece of yellow pine from another project that's about that same thickness and another piece of scrap wood that's a little bit thicker. Now, we're not going to need a bench hook this big just to saw right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this down and then I'll show you how to attach these two other pieces. of a bench hook is to give you something that you can bump up against. See, you have a piece of wood on the bottom that registers against here, and then something to push over here so that as you want to saw something, you can just kind of lean against it to saw safely. But the main thing about this is these two have to be in parallel, and it would be nice if they were perpendicular to the side that you do your cutting on. I'm right-handed, so it's this side. I would like for it to be perpendicular here, and I don't really care about this side. If you're left-handed, here's your perpendicular side. You don't really have to worry about that side. So here's our piece. This is the side we cut on the bandsaw. This was cut with a handsaw back when we were breaking this down. So this edge and this edge are factory edges. So I'm going to assume that this one is fairly straight. So my goal is to make this my brace is perpendicular with this side right here. In order to do that one, we need to make sure we have a nice square square. 
Now this is one of those plastic ones you can get at a big box store. You know, they come in orange or blue or red or green, depending on whatever store you're at. Uh, they aren't always accurate, so you want to check it. And here's what I'm talking about. I work with shop made uh, tools quite a bit, so you will see me doing this a lot in my other videos with little wooden squares. But you have to have some kind of reference edge. We are fairly confident this side is going to be straight. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to draw a line. And then I'm going to flip it over, and if it was a perfect 90 degrees, these two should line up perfectly. I will tell you, most of the time, they don't. In fact, right this one right here, the gap on this end is bigger than the gap on that end. Can y'all see that? So, this error, where it's touching in the top, is twice the error of the overall thing, because we doubled it this way. So in order to square this up, we need to remove a little bit of metal material right there. Now this, to me, is close enough for this project. But with these kinds of squares, a lot of times what I will do is I will just kind of hold it. I will take a stroke, take a stroke, take a stroke, then take a full length stroke. One, two, three, four, and now let's see if we are more accurate. One line. Second line. I actually overcompensated that time, so it's a little wider here than here. So, one, two, three, four. Those two look pretty parallel to me now. So if you're like me and you prefer using a knife as opposed to a pencil when you're doing your layouts, don't be afraid about knifing into it. These are repairable. So now that I know I have a fairly accurate square, I can come over, I'm gonna put a piece of wood there. I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a couple marks to drill holes. Clamp it off on the side of my workbench drill and countersink a pair of holes. I did the same to the other board. Then it's just a matter of gluing and screwing it down. Now ideally if you weren't in a rush you wouldn't be using screws at all because there's always a chance that, that the screw could uh, you know get into your saw and run your saw teeth but if you're like me and you're and you're in a hurry screws make excellent clamps get one in first and then make sure your alignment is dead perfect and with one in if you were to leave that sitting for maybe five minutes the glue would somewhat tack up and then put in the other two screws And flip it and do the same exact thing for the back side. And there we go. We have a bench hook that we can work against now. And the advantage of having low side is that it's low enough that you can, if you have small items, you can plane against it. So next up, I like to have an ability to clamp something somewhat in the middle of the board. And for that one, we're going to be using this uh, removable head vice clamp setup I talked about earlier. We just need to be able to drill something, a hole big enough for this size. I didn't mention that in the class six, uh, second series. Uh, I'm just going to use a bracing bit. 
Now, is being able to clamp in the middle of your bench that big a deal? No, because if you remember, we left an overhang right here. And that two inch overhang, that slack when we built the bench, is so that you can use clamps on the other side. I just find this might be easier, so I'm going to do it. And is there a reason why I'm putting it right here? Not really, other than experience. This is where I commonly use a hold fast in this kind of situation, so I just think it'll work well. But what's nice is, with this kind of top, you know, it's replaceable, it's repairable. I could just put a new hole in my workbench, and what you'll find is you'll probably put a bunch of holes in it in those first few months. But after that, you kind of get in the pattern of using the same holes over and over and over, so you don't end up using them. So you might drill six holes in various spots around your workbench, but after that, you're all set. So there we go. I can now clamp stuff to my bench. And finally, I need to be able to work on the end of a board. We're going to be cutting joinery here. And the only way you can do that is with a vise. Yes, you can clamp stuff, uh, clamp clamps to this and stuff like that. I showed you how to do that one when we built the bench. But we're going to be doing this enough that it would be really nice to build some kind of face vise. And I'm a big fan of these Moxon styles. You've seen me use them in a lot of different videos. But obviously we don't have the expertise or really time money to build something like that. Or do we? I went to Home Depot and bought a couple lag screws or something, hex heads, that kind of stuff. And we have this piece of uh, 2x12. So let's make a vise, a twin screw vise with these two. Now we've got to put two holes in this and it's going to fit somewhat flush with our bench top. So, and we want to avoid going into the plywood, we want to go into the 2 by 4s that are underneath that one. So I need to come down 2.5 inches, that way our top is 1.5 inches, so that way I'm about inch into the 2 by 4s So, I guess we can use this 2.5 inches. What do we say? Uh, maybe two inches in from each side. Make an indentation for your drill bit to get started in. Now here's the thing. We really do need to be pretty accurate when we cut these. Uh, it's not necessary that they are completely straight up and down, which that's our goal but they have to be completely parallel no matter how we go on this way so that this piece can slide back and forth evenly. If they are dovetailed in any way, this piece cannot slide. So the drill trick is to drill a hole, a, a kind of a template hole in something, and we're gonna say that's our left side, so that if you're off a little bit on this hole right here, it will be perfectly duplicated over here. That way you'll get a clean hole on both ends. The idea is you're going to use that hole Locate it, clamp it down, and then drive it through. Now once you get about halfway into the board, you can actually back it out, remove your guide, because you've already established the path 
of least resistance for your bit and then just finish it up as normal. Now if you are using a bracing bit what you're going to find is that at some point in time it's going to stop feeding and more than likely when you hit that point you reach underneath the screws already come through so just back it out reverse it and then start from the other side and that way you will get a clean hole from both directions from there you're going to want positioning on the side I personally will put it off of these metal things and make sure that your screw your threads are not going to go into any of the 2x4s that are running this way and you'll be able to see them with the screws you have just position it so it's flush with the top, or maybe a little bit tall, and we will plane it back a little bit, and then clamp it down. From here, take your threads, drop them through the hole, which is sized to get it all the way through, and give it a whack. This is just to locate that hole. Now replace your bit with one a little bit smaller. Put one of those washers over bit, find the hole, and then position the washer so it's right in the middle. So now, as you rotate, if the washer moves one direction or the other, it's wanting to travel downhill. So if you can keep it balanced so it's still, you will know that you are dead plumb. And we're pretty good at getting 90 degrees this way. If you need a long reference, just put that there and line up your lines. I will say that if you're going to be doing this a lot, this kind of work, get two different sets of bits. This one that I actually have for hardwoods, it's got fine threads. The ones with very coarse threads are better for softwoods. Now you're going to want to wax those threads really, really good. Drop it in, grab your half inch wrench. Then once you get them threaded all the way through, it moves pretty easily. After that, you're going to grab your hand plane and we want to not only level it perfectly with the top, but we also want to bevel it down a little bit. Now concerning the hand plane, I'm going to go over a kind of a summary of my hand plane lesson but if you are struggling with hand plane use or just want to know what its potentials I have a video I produce called hand planes are stupid because this really is the most finicky and stupid uh, tool you have in your shop it's kind of like one of the it's kind of like having an apprentice you can never kind of leave them alone just to do their work they always have to be fiddled with adjusted refined that kind of stuff and that entire video goes all into that. Low angle, high angle, uh, doing the cap irons, all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to give you a brief summary of some basics in this video. First, you're going to need to tune it up, meaning making sure your cap iron fits very snugly up front so no shavings are coming up underneath it. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, this is the cap iron and also making sure that it fits tightly on that edge there's absolutely no gap there and then obviously sharpening i personally on this plane number five like to put the slightest of cambers and you will understand why later in this video as we work the project you would think that it adds a curve to your finish but it is so imperceptible you won't be able to feel it but having that curve gives you a lot of flexibility and control in the tools use. And my first step is going to make it flush with the tabletop. It's a little high here. It's a pretty okay there. I'm going to actually go across the grain. That way it's not rubbing on the tabletop when it's touching here. It's going to take a shaving there. But just looking at that grain, you know it's going to blow out on this side. And this is one of those things that we talked about at the very beginning to pay attention to order of operations. If I were to put the bevel first, 
well then I would be blowing out the bevel. I would rather blow out the stuff I know I'm going to be removing later on. And going across the grain is a very quick way of getting work done. Now I'm going to deepen my cut quite a bit, so I don't want to be here forever. I know the grain, I'm pretty sure the grain is running this way. So just figure out whatever I angle I want and get after it. As you can see, I am not taking thin shavings. Now that the shaping is done, and that gives you a pretty good finish, I was just taking really heavy shavings, but to make it look a little bit better, you know, this is a much smaller plane. It is a block plane, but there's no reason we couldn't use it as a smoother. And just kind of refine the finish. Then back off the blade a little bit for your nice finishing cuts. And the last thing to do is take the vice plate back off and find a way to waller out these holes of the vice itself. You want to waller them out this way, not this way. And you know, sandpaper would be just fine. I'm using a little rat tail raft. You could take another drill if you're using a hand drill and just kind of go rrr, 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 like that. You just want to elongate it some. That way this thing will have some rack to it. And uh, you'll be able to grip a little bit better. Now I noticed mine had a crack on the bottom so I just cut a bevel on the bandsaw there. But, you know, a little make pretty doesn't hurt anywhere so you know take your sloyd knife and you know maybe put a bevel on these corners so they're not so sharp and definitely put a bevel on the inside edge right there because that will splinter on you so a nice smooth bevel looks better than a long splinter and there we go Rewax the screws, reinstall everything, and you now have a twin vise, screw vise. Now how the twin screw works is, well, you can see it's got a little bit of slop in there, so if you have something that's oddly shaped, it can clamp it. It does help to put some cork or leather right there, but I don't have any. But you come over, you come over to one side, and you set the width. Boom, it's set right there, okay? Back it off a little bit, loosen, re-tighten it. And then you come over to the other side and you tighten it up. And you'll see that it now squeezes across the entire width pretty evenly. That is not moving. And now you are able to do all the sawing you want. Voila. To take it out, all you have to do is undo one side. And then put another board, flip it around, all that kind of other stuff, and then retighten up. So you set one side, and then you're just working on the other side. So there we go. I now have a workbench with all the accessories I need to be able to work on the face of the board. So you can act your plane right up against it. Now, there are going to be situations where you're going to want to traverse a board. In that kind of situation, I will still use the the planing stop but I might put two screws into my workbench and raise them up a little bit just so it'll bump there because most of the force when you're traversing like using this right here I'm going kind of at an angle I'm not actually going straight across and so you just angle towards where you're going it's gonna work just fine 
The other thing, we needed to be able to work out on a board right here. I just explained how that happens. But what about working on the edge? Well, if any of y'all have seen me work, you know that a lot of times I do use that planing stop to work just like that. It's fast and easy, but if you have a really long board or it's a really tall board or something like that, you can use the twin screw real easy. What you can't do is just drop it right here and tighten these up. Because you'll notice that the screws are up underneath it and there's nothing down here. So what ends up happening is it'll kind of pivot on the end so now it's just gripping on the bottom of the board and this board is going to rack. Whenever you're using a twin screw, you have to have some this material on both sides of this rotating piece. So the secret is to just grab a clamp, clamp it to the edge, and now you can rest the board and drop it below the screw on this side so that now you can Clamp it tight and work your board. Easy and secure. Now the bench hooks, you know, they're pretty self-explanatory on how you're going to use them. All you got to do, bump it up and squeeze it over. But here's a problem a lot of times you have. If you're doing a long board, it wants to rack like that. So all you need to do is find some piece of wood, I'm using the same exact board, and drop it over on the edge. Now you can work, you can saw, you can chisel, you can do whatever you carve, you can do whatever you want. You have a very secure uh, board. What's even cooler is it's secure, but it's loose. So you can flip things around. If you're sawing one side, you can flip the board over, saw the other side. You can do all kinds of stuff. It's just using your body weight quickly and easily. So that extra slice of pizza will benefit you at the workbench. And of course, whenever you need it, have the ubiquitous hold fast just to secure whatever work you need. Drop it up, pop it down, come over here. And I will tell you, uh, I'm gonna show you a few really cool tricks for jointing boards using that style hold fast in the next episode, of course. So I hope I brought to your attention that there are a lot of ways you can do stuff at the workbench for holding your material, even if all you have is a slab for a workbench or a picnic table or something like that. People have been working with this kind of stuff without all the fancy metal screws, metal clamps, metal hold fast, all that kind of stuff for centuries, there's always a way. Even if it is just drilling holes in an oversized board, screwing it down, doing all your work here, and then unscrewing it. You do have options. You don't have to spend a lot of money. And you can get just as good of results as the big bench craft and those kind of vices that I really do want to get for my next workbench I'm building. So come back in our next video as we build that toolbox for all our tools to keep them organized and safe. And please consider that content creators like me kind of do this on a value for value proposition. So if you enjoy this content or you think that other people will learn from it just as much as you are, maybe consider looking down in the description to see different ways you can patronize and support this channel. I have lots of different options there. And as always, I want you to remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create, share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.